Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our webinar, Oracle J.D. Edwards, The Future is Bright. My name is Steve, and I'll be your host today. We've got a great agenda planned for you, covering everything from what's new with J.D. Edwards, showing the updated product roadmap, learning about the commitment in J.D. Edwards from Oracle, seeing a live demo of the latest features, and discussing how to plan for your J.D. Edwards upgrade. I'm very happy to be joined by two great presenters today. Uh, first, Dan Barford is the Vice President of Project Delivery at Terillium. Dan will be showing the latest J.D. Edwards features, as well as discussing how to plan for a J.D. Edwards upgrade. And Barry Campbell is the Alliance Director of a new group at Oracle, focused on supporting J.D. Edwards customers and partners in on-premise applications. Barry will introduce us to this new group, and I believe it will be refreshing to hear from someone at Oracle who's excited for J.D. Edwards customers to continue to invest in and get the most value from their on-premise J.D. Edwards system. So before we get started, I just want to share how you can participate in today's web event. Um, all attendees' phones will be on mute during the webinar. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our webinar staff, uh, just type your questions into the GoToWebinar uh, attendee panel, hit send, and then we'll address uh, all of your questions at the end of the session during our Q&A session. For those of you who aren't familiar with Terillium, I'd like to give a brief introduction. We're an Oracle Platinum Partner specialized in Oracle ERP systems, including J.D. Edwards. Bear with me one moment here. Uh, our team has received 13 Oracle Excellence Awards in our 11 years as an Oracle partner. Uh, some of the awards that we're most proud of are customer success stories. At Terillium, we believe we're only as good as our last customer references, and so we hold these uh, awards uh, most closely and, and value them the most. We have over 170 full-time employees across the United States. Uh, all of these consultants average over 16 years uh, with J.D. Edwards and within their industries. When it comes to J.D. Edwards, um, we've been helping businesses with J.D. Edwards implementations, upgrades, managed services, special projects, software licensing, cloud integrations, cloud hosting, and custom development. Uh, we are a global leader in J.D. Edwards upgrade projects, and what our big claim to fame this year is that our managed services team is very proud of the fact that our over 70 uh, customers that engage with Terillium and managed services, 100% of those customers renewed uh, their managed services contracts with us this year. So um, we're very proud of that fact and think that uh, shows that we're adding a lot of value to our managed services customers. Okay, so that's Terillium, and I'll cover the first couple of points here uh, on our agenda today, uh, and that's what's new with J.D. Edwards and also the J.D. Edwards product roadmap. So you might have heard that uh, the J.D. Edwards team at Oracle recently announced that they will be supporting the Enterprise One 9.2 uh, platform at least until the year 2028. So that's an even longer commitment that they've announced uh, for previous versions uh, in the past. This year, Oracle announced a new ongoing release model for the J.D. Edwards E1 product line. New product innovation and features are being delivered as updates that are easier to manage and consume. You don't have to wait several years before these new capabilities can be packaged and delivered through a major release. Now they can be incrementally added um, rather than embarking on a costly disruptive upgrade. Now to do that, however, you do need to be on the 9.2 release so that you can start to take advantage of this incremental update strategy 
that Oracle J.D. Edwards has created. And so that's why um, today Dan Barford will be explaining to you why it's important to start thinking about an upgrade to the 9.2 version as well as some steps that you can take uh, to start doing that. So let's take a look at the J.D. Edwards Enterprise product roadmap. Now this roadmap is published at my Oracle support, but we'll go ahead and, and display it for you here today. This, if you've seen the product roadmap in the past, this may look a little bit different to you because instead of having 9.x releases, so instead of going 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, uh, as we're used to seeing, now we've got 9.2.2, 9.2.3, 9.2.4. So you can see these releases as opposed to having big major releases every three years. Now J.D. Edwards is working on incremental releases and incremental updates to the 9.2 version. Uh, similarly for World, the support for the latest World um, iteration uh, goes out to 2025. And the roadmap looks very similar now. Instead of major releases, again, there are minor releases being done uh, more frequently. And as long as you're on that A9.4 platform, you can start to take advantage of those incremental releases rather than um, saving up and, and planning for major upgrades that in the past have been pretty costly and uh, pretty disruptive to your business. Okay, features since 9.2. Um, all of these features are uh, documented on the product catalog on learnjde.com, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and review uh, some of these now. So. You can see since 9.2 came out that there have been several uh, enhancements. First, in February, things like uh, the Internet of Things Studio, the Page Composer that let end users build their own E1 pages. Um, then in, in April 2016, more incremental improvements, health and safety task management, Outbound inventory management was a, a, a big one. Um, July 2016, there are things like mobile cloud service, JDH, JD Edwards integration cloud service, so um, major uh, benefits to the JD Edwards customers. Then we got into the UX1 foundation, as well as some roles, 32 roles were rolled out for UX1. Um, sales order entry guides, um, so some, some big updates. And then in 2017, there have been several um, features released this year. Um, One-click provisioning of J.D. Edwards, so you can go to the Oracle Store now and provision a J.D. Edwards environment. Um, in, in about 30 minutes, you can have access to a brand new J.D. Edwards environment. Uh, more UX1 roles, um, service management, uh, better usability for that module. Um, in April, even more releases, revenue recognition for real estate. Um, July, you know, just a few months later, you can see the list of additional incremental benefits uh, that were released. Um, then in October, the latest release, which is called 9.2.2, which we'll cover in uh, some more detail today. I'll take you through uh, some of the highlights of these. I won't go through all of this list, but um, just to kind of review some of the highlights here, even more roles for UX1. If you aren't familiar with, with UX1, it really combines um, user interface enhancements. So there are now over 50 roles that are shipped from JD Edwards across 23 different areas. They all follow this theme of alert, analyze, act. And so the, the thought here is that you could take advantage of a page built by J.D. Edwards that alerts you to business conditions. It allows you to analyze those conditions through delivered metrics like the, the reports or dashboards that you see on your screen, and then act on uh, those conditions by having easy navigation to get to J.D. Edwards applications. In addition, UX1, really, the, I think the power here is it allows you to build your own pages that look like that and have just what you're interested in getting alerted on 
being able to analyze and being able to act on the things that you really care about. We, they call this low-code, no-code. So that means that um, business analysts or, or you know, functional users can do these things by themselves without developers. Um, so delivering those roles out of the box, being able to build your own forms, and then also providing uh, additional search capabilities, which I think we'll cover more here. So Enterprise One Search is, is kind of a, a big shift in how people look up information and, and, and get to information. It's really the preferred way that users interact with any software system today, from navigation to retrieval uh, of data to performing actions. This is a keyword-driven enterprise-wide search on transactional data, and it's delivered as an E1 page. Um, so you can take, you know, leverage the power of an E1 page to go out and find what you're looking for uh, within JD Edwards. Next, we have E1 Mobile, and we know that Oracle uh, JD Edwards has released over 80 mobile apps. There are several new uh, mobile apps that have been released. Um, and, and some of the biggest things with these apps are the fact that you can now scan barcodes with your JD Edwards app on your smartphone, and I think Dan Barford's going to uh, demonstrate that for us today, um, as well as there are things like mobile watch lists on these apps, as well as location services, so you can see uh, what's around you. There in the example on the slide, we're looking at customers that are around us with location services on the app. So the apps are getting uh, uh, more mature and, and more usable as well, more functional. Next up, uh, it's, it's generally available now with the 9.2.2 uh, release is basket pricing for procurement. Uh, JD Edwards has had basket pricing for sales orders, but now they've taken that functionality and added it to procurement so that you can um, bundle products together in a basket on a purchase order and take advantage of discounts that your uh, suppliers uh, offer. Um, so that um, really helps you save costs in procurement. Make sure that you're taking advantage of all the discounts that your suppliers uh, are offering. Next uh, is one that we're pretty excited about and one that we've been um, you know, waiting for and, and I know a lot of users have asked for and that is uh, drag and drop functionality within manufacturing scheduling. Um, so this is called manufacturing production execution. It gives you a Gantt style graphical display of all your work orders, your work order operations, um, where you see a out of capacity condition on the, on the Gantt chart indicated by the red uh, colors there. You can drill into a work order and drag and drop it to a different date uh, or a different uh, work center in order to alleviate that out of pack capacity condition. Um, so drag and drop scheduling for manufacturing I think is is very big for our JD Edwards manufacturing customers. Um, you also get triggers when you have unexpected shortages. So for example, if, if an item went to a, a, a negative quantity, the system can trigger a cycle count to go see what's going on with that item. Um, you can get warning notifications when um, you've produced less than you expected to produce, even though you had all of the raw materials, you didn't make as many um, uh, finished goods as you expected to make, you can get warnings for those types of things. Um, so this is a, a very functional uh, new part of J.D. Edwards that's available now. And speaking of uh, notifications, um, JD Edwards now has, through its orchestrator, the ability to create new notifications. And by notifications, we mean getting a text message when something's happening in JD Edwards, whether or not you're logged in, uh, getting an email, or getting alerted within the application. You can specify when you get notified for what business scenario is happening within the software. Um, and you can then publish those notifications and people can subscribe to them. Um, so for more information on this, uh, my Oracle slide here says to go to learnjde.com 
and that learnjde.com has a new user interface. So let's go check that out now. I think this is uh, uh, pretty impressive here. So as we go into learnjde.com, as I scroll down here, you'll see that there's some, some high-level areas that you can drill into from mobile to IoT to, to cloud. If we scroll down more, we've got new releases and initiatives. And if you click in there, you can kind of see what I was covering in the slides, what's come out you know, recently in October all the way back to uh, 2016. It's a, a high-level listing of what's been released with J.D. Edwards. Additionally, if you go to additional resources and announcements, you can stay up to date with everything that J.D. Edwards is announcing. Um, and we can also go to what's new and see some detail about what they've announced. So here we've got stay informed and act fast with J.D. Edwards notifications. And I wanted to play this for you. It takes about three minutes. I think it's a really good overview of notifications. Your business is constantly in motion. Whether you manufacture, construct, grow, or service things, the activity never stops. All day, every day, you are opening and completing work orders, sales orders, purchase orders, inventory transfers, and financial transactions. And at the heart of it all is your J.D. Edwards system. J.D. Edwards provides many ways for you to get the data you need, data queries within applications, OneView reports and watch lists, UX1 pages, mobile applications, but all of these methods require you to go look for the data you need. Wouldn't it be great if J.D. Edwards could push critical information to you regardless of whether you were signed on to the system? Welcome to J.D. Edwards Enterprise One Notifications. Whether you are busy at your desk or out in the field, J.D. Edwards Notifications push critical information to you based on events or conditions that you need to know about. Perhaps a large order just came in. A shipment is going to be late. Inventory is running low. Equipment is down. Enterprise One notifications allow you to be aware of these events and to act fast. You decide which notifications you want to subscribe to, and you decide how you would like to receive these messages, whether via email, a text message using an SMS email address, or within Enterprise One. For some notifications, you can even specify inputs, such as a particular purchase order or a customer that you want to track. Or you can further define the delivery policy, particularly if the notification is based on a watch list. Maybe you only want to be notified when your watch list hits a critical threshold. After you set up your subscriptions, you'll start receiving notifications through email or as a pop-up message like this reminder for time entry, or on your phone, such as this alert that some forklifts have gone down, or within J.D. Edwards Enterprise One in the notification list under the new bell icon. Here's a notification message sent when large customer orders are received. You don't need technical programming or development skills to create notifications. Business analysts those who know your business and your Enterprise One applications best use the Orchestrator Studio to design notifications that meet your needs. When defining the notification message, the notification designer can include variables and application shortcuts to personalize the message and provide quick access to an application, enabling you to respond to the information immediately. Notifications helping you stay informed and connected to your J.D. Edwards system and your business, whether you're in the office or on the go. For more information on notifications, visit us online at learnjde.com. Thanks for watching. Okay, so thanks for watching that video. I, I think notifications through uh, the new orchestrator in J.D. Edwards uh, are really going to be huge for all of our J.D. Edwards customers. You know, the, the scenario that they, they gave an example, you know, notify me anytime there's a big sales order entered in the system. So let's say your CEO wants to know anytime we, we close a deal over $100,000. So we could set up a notification as business people, as functional uh, users. You don't have to be a developer to do this. And we, we can subscribe to CEO to get a text message 
uh, on their phone anytime we have uh, one of those business conditions. I think that's pretty powerful uh, for JD Edwards. Just a, a quick look at what's planned and what's being researched uh, for JD Edwards. Everything from uh, new mobile apps to additional innovation around uh, the user experience, and digital transformation, uh, to things like adaptive intelligence, picking intelligence and optimization in the warehouse, uh, a license plate workbench. Um, so, um, you know, we have customers asking us, is JD Edwards going away? Are we going to get forced to the cloud? Uh, we, we wanted to show you this to, to give you some, um, some security that the JD Edwards development team at Oracle is working very hard on the JD Edwards application. I think they're releasing some some great innovations within JD Edwards and, and the future really is bright within JD Edwards. The key there to take advantage of all of these kind of continuous um, innovation releases, you've got to be on 9.2 to take advantage of this stuff. Um, so we wanted to get that message across today and, and Dan will be uh, up here in a few minutes to tell us about how we start doing that. Um, along the same lines uh, of support for JD Edwards, I do want to introduce Barry Campbell. Uh, I think it's going to be refreshing to hear from Barry and his new sales group at Oracle. Um, they're really focused on helping you, the on-premise customers, um, whether you need new licenses or are concerned about what's going on with JD Edwards. You know, if you have questions like, are we going to get forced to the cloud? I think Barry and his group are going to be great people to help us uh, address those questions and really take care of the JD Edwards customers. So, so Barry, welcome to the webinar today. I, we're excited to learn more about you personally, but then also this this group within Oracle, uh, and hope that you'll tell us uh, what the group can do for the JD Edwards customers. Certainly, thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Barry Campbell. I am an Alliance Director with Oracle, and I work for a group that you may or may not know about. Um, we we realize that you may have gotten some mixed messaging. Uh, about the future of on-premise products such as JDE at Oracle. Um, but I'm here to tell you that uh, the on-prem business at Oracle is alive and, and well and healthy and, and going to be here for some time. Um, as you can see, uh, Oracle is continuing to make some, some big investments in extending our support for, for our customers in JDE um, and, and our other products such as PeopleSoft and uh, TBS. The reason that we did that is, is because we know that uh, Oracle does want to be the number one cloud provider. Yep, we accept that, but we're not going to forget who we were and how we got here. So we're not going to uh, leave the customers that have gotten us all this way and invested so much of their time and energy into these great products that, that we continue to want to build. So I'm part of an organization that represents on-premise sales only at Oracle. Um, you may or may not have actually had contact with us, but we have a whole division and whole sales team devoted just to on-premise products that aren't going to be pushing cloud, that will work with you on uh, expanding your, your JD Edwards footprint, that will work to, to make sure that you, you continue to be in compliance with the licenses that you own, to help you figure out what you're using, if you need to optimize the products. Um, but yes, we have a whole entire sales force. And we have a direct rep that, that represents your company uh, because you own an Oracle on-premise product. So um, I'd be happy to, if anybody has questions about finding the correct rep, I'd be happy to, to get you connected to the right person. Just all, all you need to do is send me an email. It's very easy. My email address is Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, that Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L at oracle.com. Again, Barry, that Campbell at oracle.com. I will connect you to your direct rep or to another partner uh, such as Terillium that, that do a fantastic job of representing all of our on-premise products. Um, they really bring a lot of expertise um, and, and history with implementing and optimizing and helping uh, companies plan their roadmap um, for their technology. So that's part of what my role is, is to help you get in touch with the right folks to, to help you on your journey and to help you continue to complete your roadmap as it comes to your technology investments. Yeah, that's great, Barry. We we definitely appreciate you taking part today, and, and I think it's great to learn that there is this group now at Oracle that's responsible for on-premise uh, as opposed to trying to push everybody to cloud. So I think that's really good news to hear, and I think the customers will be excited for that. Hopefully you'll stick around, Barry, until our Q&A session at the end. If if any of the uh, attendees today have any questions about that, feel free to, to ask. 
Uh, now I'd like to pass um, presentation over to uh, Dan Barford. Dan, I took some of his time today, but he's got a ton of great information to share, uh, including uh, showing some of the features that we've been talking about today, but then also um, getting us started to think about how do we get to 9.2 so that we can start to take advantage of all of these things that we've been hearing about. Dan, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. All right, so I'm going to jump right in and show you guys some of what Steve has provided and, you know, some of the messaging that Barry just gave us around the product and really taking advantage of the latest features. So if I switch over here, I'm going to log into an Enterprise One 9.2 instance and I think it's worth mentioning that this particular system that I'm on is a JDE in the cloud environment. Steve mentioned earlier the one-click provisioning that's available. Uh, that is one of the things that Terillium subscribes to so that we have access to the latest tools release available. And as you can see here when I'm getting logged in, you know, if you haven't seen the user interface for 9.2, it is somewhat different from old, certainly older versions of Enterprise One. Uh, the closer you are to the 9.2 release, the more familiar things will look. And as I logged in here, I was um, taken to this page called Team Customers, which is one of those role-based landing pages that's provided as part of the UX One feature. And as Steve jumped into that Learn JDE website. I'm just going to quickly switch over here to the My Oracle support and there is a document ID out there and, and we can provide this as a follow-up but 222-7250.1 is the doc ID you want to search on and that page will take you right into all of those UX1 role-based landing pages. So you can see there's a lot in financials, there's some for HR and payroll, a ton in distribution, that team customers one right here that we see on the page is the one I'm currently logged into. And then there's some for manufacturing projects around job costing and change orders and the, the rental property management module as well as health and safety. So those are all out there and when you install those, you get to take advantage of a landing page like this. And as you see how this is broken down, it, it makes a lot of sense and supports that alert, analyze, act that Steve mentioned earlier. So my alerts are over here on the left-hand side. This is my watch list panel. And watch lists are simply queries over data in the system that you've set conditions on to say, when, when uh, this particular query gets to a certain number, I want to be alerted to it, or just simply show me that number. I can see here I've got 19 held orders, I've got a lot of late orders, so that's why this particular watch list is showing up red. It's telling me I need to pay attention to that. More toward the middle of this page are these dashboards, and these are part of that UX1 landing page as well. I can interact with these dashboards. For example, I can make this one larger. If I click on a particular portion of this pie chart, it sort of brings it out so that I can, you know, if I'm maybe highlighting a particular metric or I want to just share this with other people in the organization by copying it into a slide. I can interact or turn some of these different things off and the, the, the chart responds to those changes. Off to the right hand side of my landing page here is what's known as a springboard and the springboard is a way to drill into applications quickly and again this is part of that analyze feature now and act. So I've been alerted to something and in order for me to do some more research and maybe take action on it, I can launch into an application like review orders from that springboard. What's unique about the springboard in particular is that it actually remains docked on my screen and I can always hide it if it's not something I want to see. But when you're doing analysis, you sometimes have to go to more than one application the springboard remains docked so that you can continue to go into different applications without having to return to that E1 page. It, it's essentially streamlining that workflow of your analysis 
so that you can take action on something. And when you close out of an application that was launched from the springboard, you're taken back into that E1 page. So this is one of the role-based landing pages. Uh, the next feature I want to talk about is um, I'm going to show you a watch list, and we're going to, I'm going to quickly create one because when I show the watch list mobile app later, uh, you'll see that watch list is available immediately after I create it. So this icon at the top of the screen shows me my watch list, and because this is a demo system, there are hundreds of shared watch lists is what you see underneath this shared heading. But I have a personal watch list called Upcoming Orders. I'm going to create another one based on some upcoming purchase order receipts. And in order to do that, I'm going to go into the purchase order screen. And if I just click Find, you can see some of the other things on here. I've got a custom grid set up. I've set my custom grid to have a field highlighted so it draws my attention into that amount to receive. And uh, over here, I have a query called Upcoming Inbound Receipts. I want my warehouse to be prepared for orders that are potentially going to be delivered. So I've selected that query, and now you can see I have nine records that are available within that, the criteria. If you want to see the criteria that I've chosen, I can open up my query manager, and I can see that the conditions I've set are that the quantity to receive is greater than zero, my next status is less than 999, and my promise delivery date is in a date range that's between today minus a week and today plus three weeks. So if something hasn't officially been received yet, it might still have a promise delivery date that's in the past. I kind of want to see those along with anything that's out three weeks. So those are the conditions of my query. To turn those into a watch list, I simply click this watch list icon here. It brings up my watch list manager, and because I've already selected on that query, it immediately assumes that that's the watch list I want to create. And now I can give it these thresholds. Since I've only got nine records, I'll make my thresholds small so we see the impact. And I'll say, I want to be warned if I have more than five orders that I'm about to receive. And it's critical if I have more than eight. I'll save that. It's called Upcoming Inbound Receipts. So I've now just created another personal watch list in my system, and if I come back up here to my main watch list, you can see it's there as well. So if I wanted to share this with other people in the organization, there are ways to do that. Um, and that's not something I'm going to go into today, but just because I've created this as a personal watch list doesn't mean it's limited to me. I can create a request and have that published out to others. So moving on from watch lists, the next feature I'm going to show is the form personalization feature. And that was mentioned in Steve's slides. To do that, I'm going to click on an E1 page I have called PDM or Product Data Management. And this is a classic E1 page. If you're running a version of, of Enterprise One that's, that's recent, you might have set up a lot of these using the old E1 page generator. Those are still completely applicable and can still be leveraged in the system, and I'm going to go into the item master and just drill into an item. So now I'm on this item master revision screen, which has a lot of tabs and a lot of fields. I'm going to show you how to personalize this without any programming, and it starts with me clicking this form personalization button here. That converts my form into like an edit mode, similar to creating a custom grid. And if I just give myself a little bit of extra room down here, what I'm going to do is go into this additional info tab and take this whole section of fields, because I, I do want these, and I'm going to put them on that first tab. The rest of the information on this tab I really don't care about, so I'm going to go ahead and hide that. And on the lot processing tab, I don't need anything there. I'm going to hide that whole tab. Weights and measures I'll leave alone, but I, I'm okay with it being on another tab. So now I'm focused back onto my first tab called Basic Item Data. I'm just going to drag these fields up and drop them in there. Click Save. I'm going to call this Item Simple Form and save that. 
And as soon as I close my personal form manager panel, all those edit icons are going to go away. And I now have this personalized form. And you can see here I've got a new drop down that's available that lets me switch back and forth. If I choose no personalization, I get switched back to the standard item master revisions layout. If I choose my personal form, it switches me back to that. And there's a lot more capabilities within the personal form designer that you can do. You can rename fields. You can make fields required that aren't required out of the box. And then deploy those to different departments so that as people work within these forms, you get better information created at the time it's needed versus people forgetting to fill in information on specific fields or category codes or, or whatever. You can bring all those onto a single form, narrow down what they actually have to fill in, and have that be their method of entry. Again, this required no programming, no package builds. You know, you don't have to be a developer in order to get this done. And not everyone has access to it either. That's a decision the business will make on who to provide the ability to create personal forms. I'm going to exit out of the item master and then really quick talk about the search capabilities within Enterprise One. So there's two ways you can search now. The first is within the fast path field. So anytime you um, interact and and a lot of business users may not have access to FastPath, but for people who support the business or who are in IT, they may need to quickly locate something in the system. So if I just type the word summary and part of the word availability and hit enter in my FastPath, it actually gives me all of the areas within my task view that the summary availability application exists. Now if I want to narrow down, I can actually just select this and it's going to launch me right into that summary availability application. I can even get to full menus. So if I type, for example, inventory management, the first result is the G41 menu for inventory management. When I select that, it actually takes everything off of my navigator and just leaves me with that inventory management menu, which I can then drill into and get all the way into that item master screen again if I wanted to. To get back to my navigator, I simply click that hyperlink and it returns my fast path for me to search or dr dr drill into my menus as needed. So that's kind of the menu or task view search. The other one is the enterprise search, which behaves very similarly. If I type an item number and part of the item description, you can see there's a drop down here that gives me all these different search types. I'll just click the item use and I get results that were built for an item search. And in this particular results, I don't have any supplier items that match those criteria, assets or equipment that match that criteria, but I do have quite a few item master records. This first one here is the one I was actually looking for. I have additional actions I can take from here. I can click on this information button and it brings me up another window where I now have the ability to see are there any unshipped sales orders that contain the item I just searched for? How about open purchase orders or does this item exist on any bill of materials? What about active work orders? Is this one being processed? You know, so again, by just simply typing a couple of words into the search box, I'm already into four different areas of the system getting more information about that item. And this is all configurable. So the fields that you're seeing from this work order parts list was a decision made by us to include those fields. You can pull in anything that exists in the business view that this particular search was built over. In addition to the related information, I also have an action button. So I can actually take and drill into that and it takes me directly into that item master revisions screen. It passes in that item number that I had searched on and found and you'll notice it's also presenting my personal form that I created previously. So kind of tying everything together 
and, and how you can leverage the capabilities of all the new features in the tools release. You know, by the time you create custom grids and then build queries over those grids and convert those to watch lists and couple those with a personal form and then let users locate all of those things by notifications and watch lists and search results really makes their ability to navigate through the system much, much easier. So the last thing I want to demo is with regards to mobile apps. So if I switch over here, I'm going to share my iPhone. And as Steve mentioned, there's over 80 mobile apps available. And if you're licensed for the module, then the mobile app is yours free of charge. So, and it's really easy to get started once you have your AIS server up and running. There's a URL that you can publish so that you can set up the mobile app. I already have that information plugged in and set up. But I'm going to launch the watch list app. And I'm going to be able to show you how that watch list I created for the upcoming receipts is going to be front and center. So I've launched this app, and there's the two personal watch lists that I had out there. The upcoming orders was already created, that upcoming inbound receipts I had created earlier, and then, of course, there's all the shared watch lists that I have access to. This app currently doesn't have any actionable functionality other than your ability to refresh the watch list. So I can't click on it and be taken into the app itself, but you know, it's got a tab for critical watch lists. So if I choose to go just to that, then I might be monitoring something and I can just continue to open up this app and refresh to see if that critical alert has been resolved. Another really cool app is the Inventory Availability app. So again, I'm just going to quickly log in. And this app is, is essentially an inquiry, but it does give me the ability to add attachments and things like that. So if I just do a search over the data, you see the famous red mountain bike that's in the demo data. I can drill into that particular item and see that I have a thousand available in my branch plant 10. If I go to the location of that item, it's going to give me some additional information around quantities and committed quantities. And you notice in the top right, I can drill in and see that there is an actual photo of this item. So I have a catalog image of that item. And I'm going to switch back over to Enterprise One because I did have that summary availability screen pulled up. And if I go to that item and that branch, I have the same results there. And you can see my paper clip tells me that there's a location-specific attachment. There's that same catalog image that we're seeing on the mobile app. If I come back over here, I'm going to actually add another picture. I'm going to use my smartphone and I'm going to pretend like this is the bin location of that item and I'm going to snap a picture of it. And I'll just call this bin and save that. So now I have two attachments. If I switch back over to JDE and exit this attachment screen and come back in, I should see that bin image as well. So interacting with the mobile app doesn't require processes to run behind the scenes. It's all happening in real time um, and you know, gives your users the ability to leave their desks, maybe walk around the warehouse or be out in the field interacting with JDE in a meaningful way that doesn't require them to be sitting at a desk or being in front of a, a computer. So that's really the um, a couple quick mobile apps that I wanted to show. Um, I was going to show us how to release a sales order from hold, but for time's sake, I do want to jump back over to the slides and talk about how you can start planning for your upgrade 
and that way we've got some time at the end here for any questions that anybody has. Um, and just sort of as a, a recap of what was shown, you know, there's so many features in Enterprise 1.9.2, especially with the latest tools release. Steve mentioned the notifications and the, the orchestrator. I really just scratched the surface with what I've shown today, and we're seeing our customers who, who get to 9.2 really take advantage of all of those things that provide the users with better information, easier access to things, and just an overall enhanced user experience. So let's talk about how you plan for your upgrade. And there's a lot of reasons why people are upgrading these days. Some, some general questions that you can ask in order to determine is it the right time to upgrade? Are we doing it for the right reasons? You know, you think about what would make that upgrade successful. And what are some of the driving factors behind that? And in thinking about that, what do your users really like about JDE? What do they think be better? What areas could improve their jobs? Can you give them these UX1 features and they would be happy with all of those capabilities without really needing a major process improvement? Think about how much time does your IT department spend supporting the business doing non-strategic tasks? And then what kind of upgrade are you looking at? You know, technical, functional, or is it more of a transformational type of upgrade? Additional questions, you know, do you need to stay current because of any security or compliance or regulatory changes? Are you upgrading because of the roadmap and all of the enhancements and features that are being offered? And then how capable is your team? You know, is your team been around since the original implementation or are you guys on maybe your second upgrade and, and the folks you have in the business or in IT have been through this before because if they have, you're not going to need as much support from a partner. So, you know, the initial planning steps are pretty basic. You want to start with your business case or, or the business drivers behind the upgrade. You really want to define that project, which includes your scope, your timeline, and, and take into consideration anything that might restrict the go-live date. Is, is it a busy season? Is it the potential of an acquisition? And, and once you have some of those things identified, you really want to define your team. And it's more than just putting some roles down on paper. You need to put names next to those roles so you can envision those resources being taken away from their day jobs to contribute to the project. Anytime you start planning for an upgrade, it's a good time to start looking at your licenses. Depending on how far back your version of Enterprise One goes, you're probably going to need to license some new things like the Oracle Tech Foundation, you know, or are you currently running Web uh, WebSphere and you need to move to a WebLogic environment. You should also take a look at your architecture and decide if there needs to be any changes there. Do you want to continue to keep things on premise? Are you going to go for a platform change? Maybe you're running on the i-series and you want to move to a Linux Oracle arrangement or you're on Windows and SQL and you want to move to Oracle Linux. Maybe you want to go to the cloud. There's a lot of hosting options where you can go with Oracle's infrastructure as a service or other hosted providers that takes the whole day-to-day -day management of all of that architecture off your hands and puts it into the responsibility of someone else. And then finally, you want to determine that upgrade type. Are you going to go with a like-for-like -like upgrade? Take the features and functionality and the customizations that you're built into your system today, move those into 9.2, and then position yourself to go into a continuous improvement roadmap where you leverage new features incrementally as they're released, or you take time to eliminate modifications or optimize processes. The next thing to consider is how customized are you? You know, as a general rule, you want to avoid customizations unless it's a real business differentiator or provides you with a competitive advantage. We all know that customizations cost time and money every time you need to take an update because those customizations may need to be tested again, regression tested, or retrofitted. If you 
know you're going to have to take some of these customizations forward, it's a really good exercise to catalog and prioritize them so you understand the scope and importance of each one and you can build that into your upgrade plan. Along with customizations, usually includes integrations as well, and these integrations can be everything from EDI to interfaces with third-party products um, or other third-party products, like maybe you're a CreateForm user and you need to make sure that the latest version of Enterprise One works with your version of CreateForm. Maybe you have a data collection system that you need to take into consideration. So do some analysis on those integrations. Make sure they're still supported. Will they work in a web-based environment? You know, one of the recommendations that we see a lot is to, if the integration will work as is in the new version, the upgrade may not be the excuse to change it. You know, if it continues to function the same, you can focus on other value-add areas versus introducing a new failure point or risk by re completely rewriting an integration. And then finally, is part of your reason for upgrading part of a bigger plan of a digital transformation, which may include now the use of business services in J.D. Edwards or some other service-oriented architecture or SOA platform that you want to incorporate into your enterprise applications. From a data perspective, you want to take a look at how much data you have because it will take time to convert that from whatever release you're on into 9.2. Depending on how far back you go, that may include a Unicode conversion as well, which introduces a little bit more time in the conversion and also increases the size of your data overall. So in order to truly understand the effort there, you want to run multiple practice conversions during your project. That gives you the timing of what's needed at Go Live Weekend. And it's also a good time to visit any data policies that you have around archiving and purging. If you have none and your data goes all the way back to 1996 and you've never purged or archived, now might be a good time to start taking a look at some of those opportunities to trim down the data prior to upgrading. Testing, one of the most important parts of the project, and you can't really test without making sure you have all of your processes documented, and that then you use those as inputs to your test scenarios. You'll want to run multiple tests in various styles. A unit test just takes functionality at face value and ensures it's working. Integrated testing is more of an end-to-end -end where you know, the, the input from one department or the output from one department is the input to another and you want to see those transactions flow all the way through. And then, of course, a user acceptance test where the business is saying we agree that the amount of testing we've done is sufficient on this new version for us to go live. And I also recommend putting someone in charge of a testing audit, which means, you know, just not just the project team coming up with scenarios and processes that they need to test, but someone from an outside view, maybe it's someone from a management or an executive position, just double checks the scenarios and the processes that are being tested and provides some feedback to make sure nothing was missed. And then of course you can't go live without training and making sure you answer these five questions around who needs to be trained, what topics do they need to be trained on, where are these resources located? Therefore, how will we train them? And when does it make sense to conduct that training? If you do it too early, they may forget unless they remain involved in the new version until the go live. If you do it too late, you run the risk of running out of time. So working with your partner to really position the training at the right time within the project plan makes the most sense. And we've seen a lot of success in training for upgrades focus mostly on the navigation and the new UX1 features. And that can be conducted several times because it's probably a two or three hour training at most. And it, it doesn't take much for users to recognize the screens they're in once they've learned how to navigate through the new user interface in 9.2. 
So with that, that sort of concludes the how to get started or plan for your upgrade. I covered quite a bit in a short amount of time with demoing some of these features and sort of running through what you can do to get started. If you want to learn more, you can send us an email at weknowjde at terillium.com and even schedule a one-on-one -on -one demo that goes into even more depth and overview of the UX1 features. So I'll turn it back over to Steve to sort of close things and then we can take a look if there's any questions that have been posted out there. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And, and I'll encourage everyone uh, quickly here that if you do have questions uh, for me, for Dan, for Barry, or even uh, technical functional questions uh, that we may have to follow up on, please submit those. Just type in your question in the GoToMeeting pane and, and we'll be happy to answer those now. Um, I know um, we presented a lot today, so a lot of new features, um, a lot of you know new versions. Dan showed a lot live from UX1 to building queries and watch lists and personalizing forms, uh, the mobile apps. We talked a lot about upgrades. One of the things that Terillium offers that I think takes all of that you know kind of information by the fire hose and distills it a little bit. Uh, personalizes it to your company and how you do JD Edwards, we call it an assessment. And so that's where we come in and, and look at how you're using JD Edwards today, uh, compare that to new features within the new releases, and, and work with you to come up with a roadmap to should you upgrade, if you do, what kind of benefit are you going to get out of it, and, and what does your path look like, what kind of an upgrade, and then what comes after the upgrade, and to keep you on that continuous improvement that Dan talked about. So I think that's valuable and we're always happy to engage uh, in those types of processes with our customers. Um, so thanks Dan, great presentation and um, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the questions here and if you have more continue to type those in, we'll answer them all here today uh, or try to at least. Um, so Dan, we have a request here, that I think it was the document number from, e, from Oracle Support where we can find the E1 pages. I think we can um, document that and send that to the person who's asking this question here uh, privately. Um, here's a question for you, Dan. It, actually, I think he's going to display that document number while we talk. Um, will FastPath pick up custom applications, menus, and UBEs? And I think we mean the search here, Dan. If we've got custom apps or menus or UBEs, can we use that E1 search to find those? Absolutely, yes. So the search, I should have mentioned this, is real-time. So it's going over the tables behind those search results. Um, in fact, I believe it's a component of Data Browser. And so if you have a custom menu, a custom application, uh, it will locate those. And, and what's nice about the search is you don't need to know the description. You can actually type P55-4 and hit enter. And if, if it doesn't find an exact match, it will present you the results of every application that contains those particular characters. Okay, thank you. Um, this question, Dan, uh, I don't know if we can answer this, but what additional security is available for the mobile apps? So the mobile apps follow the standard Enterprise One security workbench. So if that summary availability app that I launched, if I don't have access to that in Enterprise One, I would not be allowed uh, to log into that app. And then it's also controlled on, um, you know, the, there's a URL behind the AIS server that is the access point for uh, those mobile apps. So it, it, it does add a little extra control around um, how you can distribute and, and deploy those apps. As okay, far as yeah. any any additional security, I'm not I'm not aware of. Okay, another question here. Um, let me make sure I understand this. H how much work is involved in setting up watch lists that use custom business views and tables? Well, it's really not much work because if you a watch list really needs a query, and in order to build a query, you need an application. But that application can be Data Browser. 
So you can open a business view in Data Browser and then build a watch list over top of it and therefore have that available. Um, typically, we recommend having that business view be attached to an application. That way, you know, you can actually launch into it when you drill into that watch list. But watch lists work over custom tables, custom business views, and custom applications. Yeah, good point. And, and then, you know, the, the metrics and charts that we saw are really one view components, which also work over uh, custom business views. And so you can open up a custom business view in Data Browser and write either a query, a watch list, or a one view report over it, right? So if you don't want to build an application, you can do all of those things in Data Browser. And of course, if you did build a custom application over a custom business view, you can do all those things as well. Um, yeah, the, the recorded version of this webinar uh, will be published shortly, uh, and um, we'll, we'll send it to the person who asked. But for anybody who wants to see a recorded version of this webinar, it's the same place where you registered to get, this, to, get to this webinar. Um, if you go back there tomorrow <laughs> and re-register, it'll start playing the recorded version. Um, so, Dan, follow-up question to the security of the mobile apps. Can we have two-factor authentication for mobile apps? I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. I don't believe it supports two-factor authentication or the Touch ID capability, but I believe those are on some planned roadmap from Oracle. So did you notice how I had to physically log in? I didn't have an option to use Touch ID on my iPhone to launch that app. And, and no two-factor authentication that I'm aware of. Okay, yeah, so not available uh, now, but that's on the, one of the uh, roadmaps that J.D. Edwards is looking into that. Okay, that looks like the uh, extent of the questions that we had. So, Dan, I want to thank you for your uh, presentation on upgrades as well as the live demo of the features. and. Barry, thank you very much for joining us. It's, I think it's great to know that your organization exists and there are people at Oracle focused on on-premise customers and on-premise licenses. I think our customers are uh, probably surprised and excited to know that, uh, that that organization exists. And I want to thank all of the attendees for your time today. I hope that you found this valuable. If you do have any further questions, please just let us know and we'd be happy to to answer anything that we can. So thank you everyone, have a good afternoon.